The second one specifically contradicts what we read uh, concerning the theory of evolution. So I want to get into the Bible text about, okay, what does the Bible say related to creation? We're going to kind of branch off from that uh, as we go. I believe the Bible is the most accurate, is exactly accurate, infallible record of what occurred at the beginning. And so I want to use that as a starting point. And y'all forgive me, I left my uh, clicker at school. I thought about that this morning as I was driving here. I don't think I put that in my bag, and I didn't. So anyway... Brother D. Moore talked about that last week, so I've gotten so spoiled, I'm too lazy to punch, a, punch the computer. So anyway, uh, here's what the Bible says. Genesis 1, verses 1 through 5. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Such a simple statement, but so profound, as we said, the start of all things. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. There was no light. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. It's amazing every time you read this, the power of God and his word. You know, the Bible in, in this chapter, it talks about we and us. Uh, and John chapter 1 talks about Christ being there in the beginning. Uh, we see here the spirit of God moving over the face of water. So you see the Trinity here even in this uh, first part. But it's amazing when God said it, I mean, it happens. I mean, it's just, just amazing how powerful he is. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. And so apparently, from a scientific standpoint, this must be the point at which God began the rotation of the earth. And it's been rotating ever since, uh, like clockwork, uh, throughout history. So he created the light, and again, it's interesting that he created the light without the light source, uh, without the light source that we think of, the sun, moon, and stars. And I think I mentioned this in passing the other day. People talk about, well, the universe has to be old because it takes uh, uh, 4.6 billion years for the light to reach the earth. Well, he created the light in its finished form. You know, to wh wherever it's going to be, the light rays he already created before he created the light source. So again, that's, again, mind-boggling to me. All right, second day, and God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. And we talked about that a little, little bit last time. People talk about what's the firmament. Well, again, the Bible is its own best interpreter. We see later on it talks about the birds flying in the firmament. So we think about the air we breathe, our atmosphere, and so forth that he's creating uh, in this particular um, day. Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divide the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so, and God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. So again, firmament, I was reading about that the other day. Uh, the idea of firmament can, sometimes the Bible refers to like the entire universe and solar system and all that. So again, that, that can be a part of this too. But uh, again, later on we read of the birds flying in the firmament. So it talks about the dividing of the waters, and we don't see land yet, it hasn't been divided that way, but dividing the waters on the earth from waters above the earth. So again, what is that? I mentioned y'all um, last week, or two weeks ago, uh, now the water canopy that some creationists believe in. Uh, that there was a water canopy above the earth, and that might be, might be the source of the flood waters and might answer a lot of things. I was reading, um, I subscribed to uh, emails from this one creation group. Uh, and I, this morning, matter of fact, the one that I watched this morning, about a 15-minute video, they were talking about this uh, water canopy. And in this, uh, these particular creationists, these are not evolutionists, but they were saying that most creationists, I'm, I'm just saying this, y'all can think what you want to. I, I, I'm not sure either. But said... Um, a lot of creations now are kind of getting away from the water canopy thing. That They no longer seem to, many do not believe that, that adds up in a lot of ways. And uh, I mentioned to y'all, uh, there was a guy from Apologetics Press that came and spoke to our school five or six years ago. And that was something on my mind. I happened to, I asked him afterwards. I, I was too shy to ask a question, but I went up to him afterwards and said I enjoyed your presentation. What do you think about this water canopy theory? What's your thinking on that? And so here's somebody we have a lot of confidence in said, well, he no longer thinks that there was a water canopy 
uh, he believes that'd be unscientific. And his point in the video I saw this morning said they think the earth would have gotten too hot if there had been a water canopy, some about gases and stuff that would give off from the water vapor that it would have cooked the planet. I mentioned y'all, you know, I could see, and that Brother Mike uh, Marshall was uh, listening to some of this, and he uh, talked to him a couple weeks ago. We're talking about, you know, kind of holes that on uh, Antarctica. I said he had been to Antarctica, which, I, which is neat to me. Uh, so he had been there, and, and so they were talking about how the, the holes at Antarctica, they talk about ozone and stuff like that. A lot of the people there felt like it was the planet's way of releasing gas uh, and re releasing heat when things got too hot. And he said uh, on one occasion the, uh, when he was there, the hole, they said one year was like the size of Texas, and then the next year it was like it wasn't even there. You couldn't even hardly see any hole at all. And so they said they believe it, it expands. So uh, anyway... My point to that is, if there was a water canopy, I think there'd be some way that God could have released that heat uh, if there had been. Uh, again, they were saying on this video some, some reasons why people believe there's a water canopy. One, again, it talks about dividing the waters from the waters. Again, could those waters above just be the clouds? Could be. Could, could be. Um, that, that could be it. Um, a couple of problems with that, and they kind of explain this away, would be, well, if there were clouds, that means there would be rain. So was the rain before the flood? And that's kind of debated by Bible scholars. And these were Bible-believing guys I was listening to this morning. So, well, um, they don't believe some of the passages like the fact that it watered in the Garden of Eden that mean it, was, it stayed that way uh, after Adam and Eve left the garden or maybe there was rain in addition to that. Um, and then Hebrews 11, when it talks about Noah seeing things as... Uh, Believing things had not been seen yet doesn't necessarily mean not rain at all, but maybe a flood of that scale. So again, I don't know. That was one thing they talked about. Um, let me see. There was something else I was going to bring up on that too. But anyway, they had some things to explain. My, my saying to that is my my opinion. I'm not sure myself. So it's something I want to continue studying. I encourage you to do and share information with me. So again, was there one a canopy, or is this is this the cloud cover? I guess the other thing is the rainbow. I guess the other thing I was going to say about that, that when I read Genesis 8 and 9, when it talks about the rainbow, it seems like that was a new thing, uh, which, oh, yeah. which only after the flood. Now, those guys this morning were saying, well, it could mean it was a new meaning to something that was there. Well, maybe, but it kind of seems like to me just it, there was. So anyway, there's some things that the water canopy theory would seem to solve, but then, like I said, there are some creationists, not evolutionists, some creationists think, well, that's, we don't have to believe in water. So regardless, whatever this was, whatever the water's above, whether it was a water canopy or whether it was just the cloud cover, uh, again, God created, the, the point is, he created the atmosphere just like what you and I need. He gave us just what we need to live and for things around the world to live. Uh, yes, Charlotte? All right, in Mark 13, 19, it says, in those days shall be affection such as was not from the beginning of the creation which God created to this time neither shall be. Yeah, that's interesting, Charlie. That's uh, there. Jesus talking about the destruction of Jerusalem and how the suffering and in, in, in the destruction was worse of any time since history began. So, yeah, that's, that's an interesting passage there. Uh, any other thoughts, comments on day two? And, uh, of course, you can kind of understand the, I've never really thought about the wind, wind canopy, but and since you mentioned that in uh, Genesis 7, verse 11, it says, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 70th day of the month, the same day were, notice it, all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and I'm not sure exactly what it's referring to in the great deep, and the windows of heaven were opened, so I don't know, and then in, in the next verse it says, and the rain was falling there four days, forty nights. So when it says the windows of heaven were opened, it might have been just normal rain like we have, a lot of it, of course, for forty days. Or I don't know, could have been something, some special thing, other than just normal rain like we have. So it says, and I, I guess maybe, maybe that's where some of them got the idea about the, the canopy, where it says the windows of heaven were opened. And then I'm not sure the fountains of the great deep, exactly what that refers to, whether, I mean, you, you may get into that, but it's interesting.
two different things that occurred at that point. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, yes, the, the, the windows of heaven opened up. That's what a lot of them would say. Well, that's the, the canopy falling, right. you know, created this heavy rainfall. And again, could be, could be, or, you know, again, God can do what God wants to do. The, uh, we will talk more about the, uh, the ocean, uh, the water coming from the, the great deep. Uh, a lot of people believe that, uh, that the oceans were parted with great earthquakes and water came shooting up and so we'll, we'll talk about some of that too at some point, but great point, great point. Any other thoughts on day two? All right, day three. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. Again, it's just amazing how God said it, and it was so. So you got uh, dry land appearings. And again, a lot of people believe this is this, like the ocean floors in some places rising to become what we see visibly. So the, the rising of some of the sea levels and the trenches being formed and this sort of thing. And God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters called he sees. And God saw that it was good. And again, on this point of dry land, some believe at one point that even some creationists believe there was one continent. Uh, you, you've heard of um, people talk about uh, Pangea uh, theory. There's some creationists believe that too, and um, we'll get into that more later on. But you know, could there have been one big landmass rather than what we see today? Maybe, but, but we'll get into that later on. And God said, "Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind." There's something else that is interesting in, in Genesis one. How many times it says after its kind or his kind? We'll talk about that more later on too. But the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. It happened just like God said it was going to happen. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. I was just said one thing about this is kind. There is a uh, scientific principle that scientists espouse to, even though they believe in evolution, called biogenesis that is named after this and the idea of things producing after his kind. You know, if, if you um, buy a, a pack of tomato seeds and you plant them and corn comes up, you don't think, hmm, these tomatoes evolved into corn. I think somebody put the wrong seed in my packet is, is what you think. So tomato seeds give you tomatoes. Corn seed gives you corn. Watermelon seed gives you watermelon. And that's been the case from the beginning uh, since day three. All right, day four. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven. This is interesting here because you, he has already created light in day one. So he's already created the light, but now he gives the light source uh, here in day four. Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven for these purposes. Well, why God, apparently you didn't have to create these for us to have light. So what was the purpose of these? He tells us, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. Okay, so we got the, the sun in its location as we rotate. Uh, we have day and night. Uh, let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. So, again, we talked about, uh, well, the Lord mentioned the tilt of the earth. You know, has the tilt changed on the planet? Very well may have. But apparently, even at the very beginning, there were some seasons Maybe they weren't as dramatic as what we see today, but apparently there were some seasons uh, and ancient men have been able to determine uh, years uh, from, from way back. Some people say, I've heard this argument, and again, we've looked at this a little bit in our world history class at school, were the years of ancient men the same as ours? Well, yes and no. Say, so what do you mean? Well, like we were, we were studying um, with the uh, middle school kids, the Sumerians, uh, had a year that well, was about 354 days. So their year was 354 days. So we said, well, there are 11 days behind our calendar. Didn't that make a big difference over time in our years? No, because they could watch the sun, and when their uh, years got out of line, they would just add a month from time to time. So they would add a 13th month. So our years and their years do correspond. And so from very early on, we are able to tell with the revolution of the earth you know, how long a year is, that it's 365 years six hours and so many minutes and seconds. I used to know that. I've forgotten that. All right, but again, it started that from the very beginning. But these, so you think about that, the this, this sun, how we're, with our rotation, we have our days 
And as we revolve around the planet, uh, around the sun, uh, that's our years. We can tell when we're back to where we started from. Again, it, and again, I, not that I can tell it, in this, but I mean, we can all see that. Uh, again, it's kind of cool. And I, again, I talk to my kids about this too. I never had paid much attention to this until I was teaching uh, world geography. But if you watch where the sun comes up throughout the year, you know, it's kind of neat. You know, if you get in September and October, it's almost straight here. This time of year, the, the sun is shifting further and further to the south. And as, as after December 21st, it's going to start coming here until June 25th. So it's, ancient men have been able to see that from, from since the beginning, uh, these sorts of things, this phenomenon. But it's interesting when you think about the, um, the earth, the precision, the precision. I heard a speaker one time, uh, a creationist, that was talking about, um, he said the earth rotates, he was talking about an article he had read, the earth rotates 1,000 miles per hour on its axis at the equator. Again, we, we don't even feel like we're moving, but here I think it's like 600 or 700 miles per hour that we're going around where we are. But 1,000 miles per hour at the equator with a forward speed of 67,000 miles per hour going around the sun. So we're spinning 1,000 miles per hour with a forward speed of 67,000 miles per hour. Some think the sun is moving through, and none of these things are hitting each other, and it's all just perfect to what we need. And he said, the, uh, the speaker said this, the title of the article that he got, read this was Earth's Lucky Break. It's all that, this, this precision of the universe, and look how lucky we are. Instead of seeing the design of the creator that did all these things. Again, it's, it's awesome. Our... Our, but again, going back to signs and seasons, think about our month. Well, what is approximately, what is, what is months been based on throughout history? Moon. The moon, right? It's the various things of the moon. That, that's approximately a month. And so all these things we see, the sun and moon and stars, uh, we've been able to use to track time. Uh, from the beginning, in days and years and months, etc. So that was the purpose of those put in by God. He didn't have to put those in at all, but it's helped us track time. And again, that's a big part of our discussion is time. Uh, again, evolutionists want those millions and millions of years or billions of years, 13.8 billion or whatever they got to have, and they got to have that for the theory to make any sense. But history doesn't show that. I mean, history doesn't. Science wants that. But when you look at history and you study history, it does not put those millions of years. You don't see that in the recorded history. All right, back to our reading here. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the sun, and the lesser light to rule the night, the moon. I've heard my dad talk about this. He made the stars also. It's amazing, mind-boggling when you think about how many stars there are in the universe. It just kind of, God just flippantly says, made the stars awesome. So again, that's, that's an awesome thing. And again, we can't even begin to number the stars. And yet, uh, we're told in Psalm 147, verse 3 or 4, one of those, uh, that God names the stars. He has a name for all of them. We can't even count how many, though. Uh, and God set them in the firmament. So here's the firmament, like the universe is what firmament would mean here. I uh, set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. There was a whole lot that went on that fourth day. And, and again, we are, are just kind of mind-boggling to think about uh, all that happened with that. All right, day five. And God said, let the waters, some of the oceans and rivers and so forth, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life. That's an amazing thing there too that we know in our modern times, we think about how many things there are in the water. The microbes and bacteria and, and all the, the little things that you can't even see in the water that were created by God in, in this particular thing. And I saw the article was talking about there's only about 1% of the ocean that has been explored. Wow. Because it's so deep in places. Right. Wow. When you go down deep in these uh, submersibles, wherever they are, they go about a mile and a half away. And there's no light down there. But the creatures down there, they, they put off the fluorescent light as they move. And it's just amazing. It, it, yes, it is. They don't have names for any of those. Right. right. Yes, sir. Great point. Great point. So let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl, the birds, uh, that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great wells, and every living creature that moveth, 
which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth, in the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Again, a very simple statement. But can you think about the complexity uh, of what exists? Brother Lloyd just mentioned a minute ago, the complexity that we see in the oceans and in the air, the birds that we see. Again, it, it blows my little feeble mind. All right, day six. So again, everything is getting prepared to bring you and I into the world. God made a, a perfect place uh, for us to live. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and the beast of the air after, after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And again, that's interesting. Let us make man. So there's the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit in the very beginning. Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. He created all the land creatures there before he created Adam and Eve. And he gave us dominion over the animals. Now, this is a kind of interesting discussion. We'll get to this later on in our study. But like one of, the, one of the things that I want to try to hammer toward the end of our discussion is the matter of dinosaurs, which is a very interesting thing to me. People say, well, the dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago, and men came on the scene, our primitive ancestors, about 3 million years ago. So we're separated by the dinosaurs by 62 million years. Men and dinosaurs did not live together. And evolutionists will get mad if you try to say that they, they did. The evidence is overwhelming, though. We're going to talk about that more. I was studying some of that the last couple of days. The evidence is overwhelming that men and dinosaurs did live on the planet at the same time. And the evolutionists will say, well, there's no way. These fierce creatures would have, would have uh, destroyed mankind. Well, think about that for just a minute. And, and we'll get to that more later on. I think men actually hunted the dinosaurs. And I think that may be part of the reason it went extinct. We'll talk about that more, like I said. Had dominion, had dominion over them. So they say, well, we, well isn't there a lot of animals like that today that, that if, we were, if we had no weapon, like a, if you put a lion in this room, we wouldn't stand much of a chance uh, if there was a lion in here amongst us or a tiger or a cobra. Or, there's a lot of things that would kill us. But yet you and I are surviving pretty well. There's 7.8 billion people on the planet we're, we know to stay away from those, but yet many of those animals we just mentioned have been hunted almost to extinction over year, the years. We're smart enough with our intellect to be able to subdue and to kill those creatures or use those creatures in whatever way. So the idea of, again, such a faulty argument, and that's one that, again, one of the main reasons they say, well, men and dinosaurs couldn't live together because the dinosaurs would have killed men. No, no, they wouldn't have. We would know how to stay away. There's a, a we'll get this later on too. There was a, I came across by accident a few years ago a passage in Marco Polo's book. And y'all are familiar with Marco Polo. He was from Italy. He visited China uh, from 1271 to 1295. And he came back and wrote a book about it and that people all over Europe wanted to read this book. But in his account, he talked about uh, dragons. And we look at the descriptions, it sounds just like what you read about in the dinosaurs. So Marco Polo, it looks like to me, in the 1200s, in the 13th century, saw with his own eyes dinosaurs in China. And it's interesting, when you look at the, uh, the Chinese calendar, the, and again, I, I haven't paid a lot of attention to that, but I've been at a Chinese restaurant before, and you see they got the 12 animals for the various months. 11, one of those is dragons, but the other 11 are animals that we see today. And they say, well, it couldn't have been. You know, well, I think, I think it was. But. The ark there in Kentucky, Cages, different animals, and several of them have dinosaurs. So whoever designed that ark believed there were dinosaurs. Yes, sir. That's that's right. And, and that's another point. They say, well, these huge creatures, how could they fit on the boat? Yeah, they got babies. Okay. You, that's exactly that's exactly right. But I mean, if you think about it, coach, they're like, oh, well, they're massive. Well, elephants are massive today, and we and we coexist. Yes. With them. And the closest thing we have to anything that looks like a dinosaur with teeth is alligators and crocodiles. Right. And unless you're standing on the edge of the water and that one's hungry, they yeah. don't randomly come yeah. on us. Yeah, 
That's exactly right. Is that every every predator out there today has its own prey it, it goes after unless right. it's at a point of starvation. Right. To where it wants to seek us. To, to a T Rex, we would look like a snack. <laughs> there you Why go. Why does he want to extend the energy to go after a snack? If there's another beast he was meant to hunt, that yeah. actually would fill him up. That's exactly right. It's like we don't go look for animal crackers. We're starving to death. Now, if we're starving, yeah, we'll pick up crumbs and eat them. But other than that, we we try to find a meal. Yes, sir. That's right. That's right. Good point. Good point. There's, there's ways they put fish in aquariums with sharks swimming around. They yes. Just make sure the sharks are full. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Good point. Good point. So again, God created us in our own image, and, and what, a, what an awesome thought that is. To me, that's one of the other harms of evolution when they teach, okay, you came from a lower life form. You're just a highly evolved animal. You're an accident, whereas we know we're created by God for a purpose. He created us in his image. And talking about if, if we would start teaching that to our kids around the country, what would that do to self-image? Okay, you didn't come from an animal. You're made in the image of God, not, not some, some uh, cosmic accident that occurred. Anyway, hopefully, one of these days, I hope some of that will uh, come back into schools. Verse 28, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, to Adam and Eve. Now, again, in Genesis 2, he gives more detail about the creation of man. There's, I think I mentioned this to y'all. There's some say that Genesis 1 and 2 contradict each other. No. Genesis 2 is given supplemental information, some stuff he left out here, giving more detail of the creation of man. But God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which upon the face of all the earth, and every tree, and the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat. And every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat. The the the, again, the various plants and so forth given to, for our nutrition. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made. And notice this. Behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Everything up to this point, it was good. It was good. It was good. It was good. Right after the creation of Eve, it said it was very good at that point. So everything at that point is perfect in God's creation. Now, that's, that's the, the simple, straightforward reading of that. Uh, Charlie, you had a point. I, in uh, Colossians 1.16, it says, All things were created by him and for him. That's exactly right, Charlie. So, again, Christ was there in the beginning. That's exactly right. He was among the us there that created everything. That's a great point. Yes. Now, there are some, of course, evolutionists believe what they believe, but there are some um, people who call themselves believers that will try to insert the millions of years, and they want to try to hold on to both. So, okay, well, uh, we believe the Bible, but well, all, this, all this evidence from these scientists looks so compelling. Uh, how can we tie the millions of years together with what the Bible says? How can we take what these guys that have given us so many conveniences, they must know what they're doing, how can we tie those two together? It's unfortunate people approach it that way. I, I, as I say, there's different types of science. I was reading about this the other day. There's what you call operational science and historical science. Operational science is facts that you observe and so forth. They use to, to give us all the things we do. Historical science, I think, is a bunch of hogwash. Most of it is uh, with, about the evolution and all that. Different type of science altogether. But there are some that are trying to tie these together. So one thing that has uh, been put out there by, uh, by people that try to hold on the Bible is the gap theory. This the idea that between Genesis 1-1, which says in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and then it talks about uh, the earth being without form, that there's millions or billions of years between uh, verses 1 and 2. So there's a gap of, uh, again, eons of time. It was interesting, and I, I, I don't want to disparage uh, somebody that's passed on that I have a lot of respect for. When I was, so I will put this out there, and again, y'all, some of y'all may espouse of this. I was reading uh, Roy Deaver's commentary on the book of Romans. Let me preface what I'm about to say by saying it was an excellent commentary. Excellent commentary. I read it a number of years ago. Very worthwhile. But there was a um, pastor that kind of surprised me, his take on it in Romans 8 where it talked about the earth uh, groaning there in verse 22 or, or thereabouts. And uh, 
again, Brother Deaver didn't say this was the case, but he said, you know, well, possibly, he seemed to be espousing this idea, well, possibly uh, there was eons of time in between verse 1 and 2. Again, he wasn't dogmatic about it and say, but saying, well, maybe there's that possibility. Um, maybe uh, some big catastrophe had happened to the original creation and then it was recreated. Uh, I think that's unnecessary, and uh, I don't believe that. I don't believe that's the, the reading. Of that. I don't think that's what Romans 8 is talking about. But, again, there's a man I highly respected, and, and so, again, I'm not trying to disparage him, and maybe, maybe I misunderstood some what he was saying. It seemed to be leaving, I won't say he believed in the gap theory, it seemed to be leaving the, the door open for that. There are some that believe, well, there's a big gap between verse 1 and 2. Well, I'll share something with you about that. I, I do not believe that. We're out in the history of <clears throat> country or a nation or the world or a history of a person, if you start off writing about it, I mean, just all of a sudden you left out 20 or 30 years, that'd be kind of a ridiculous way to yes, write it would. Yes, it would. Yes, it would. And you'd ha everybody would have to admit, that would be a really forced reading of the, of the text right here to say, well, we can fit millions and millions of years. This, I mean, you'd have to try to put that in. Right, you, have to you, have to, you have to work to get that in. Another one that's probably more popular uh, by many uh, people that espouse the Bible is the day-age theory. This idea that each day was actually a long period of time. And y'all are familiar with that and heard people talk about that. Well, day one, you know, could have been millions and millions of years. Day two could have been millions and millions of years. Day three could have been millions and millions of years. Again, very forced reading to read that into the text there. And there's a lot of problems that that causes too. If on day three the plants were made uh, and it's daylight for millions and billions of years, it says morning, evening and morning, and then it's going to be night for millions of years, those plants are going to struggle with photosynthesis and all that if that's the case. So there's a lot, a lot of problems that will come from that. All right. But again, what, what does the Bible say? Now, the Bible, I've always heard and y'all have heard too, the Bible says own best interpreter and Jesus being one of the most uh, being there, as Charlie said, Jesus was there. Here's what Jesus says about it. You're familiar with Matthew 19 and the, uh, the question of divorce and marriage and this sort of thing when they asked him that question. And he, Jesus, answered and said unto them, have you not read? And he's quoting from Genesis 1 and 2 here, that he which made them, Adam and Eve, at the beginning made them male and female and said, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they twain shall be one flesh. And he goes on to say, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. Well, again, we know day one is in the beginning. What day were Adam and Eve created? Day, day six. Now, if there were millions and millions of years, if each day were millions and millions of years, could you honestly say that day six or Adam and Eve were created at the beginning? I don't think you could say that. But Jesus says, Adam and Eve created on day six were created at the beginning. Seems like to me that contradicts the millions and billions of years that people tried to put in. Here's another one. Here's another one. In Luke 11, this, again, Jesus talking here. But again, the, the best authority on this subject. Therefore also said the wisdom of God, and this is when he's uh, prophesying the destruction of Jerusalem and, and this sort of thing. I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they shall slay and persecute, that the blood of all the prophets, notice this, which was shed from the foundation of the world, so my blood being shed near the foundation of the world, may be required of this generation. And he defines it. From the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zechariah, which perished between the altar and the temple, verily I say unto you, it shall be required of this generation. And that part's a, a, another topic for another time. Was that Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, that, uh, that died from Joash, as Brother Bill taught us? Is that the Zechariah? Is it Zechariah the prophet uh, that's talked about there? Is it Zechariah the father of John? So, so again, we're not sure about that particular part. But notice this. The blood shed from the foundation of the world from the blood of Abel. So Jesus identifies the blood of Abel that was shed by Cain as being shed from the foundation of the world. Again, if it's millions and millions and millions of years, you couldn't honestly say that was from the foundation of the world. Now, again, when did the event with Cain and Abel happen? We don't know for sure. We can kind of put a limiting factor. If we did that as a mathematical formula, we could do a less than or greater than sign. We know that Seth was born when Adam and Eve were 130. 
and Eve uh, said this is a replacement for Abel. So Abel had died. So it happened somewhere less than 130 years before the, uh, uh, from the start of the, the planet. So we don't know exactly where. So this is, this is uh, less than 130 years uh, from the creation of the world. So some 130 years from the foundation of the world, you could say is around the foundation of the world. Something that's millions and billions of years removed, you couldn't honestly say that. So Jesus talked about from the beginning, Adam and Eve, that Abel was killed at the foundation of the world or near the foundation of the world. And look at a couple of other, two others I want to share with you. Uh, Exodus 20 verse 11 says, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. The obvious reading without a, an evolutionary bias is, I mean, what would you think? Seven days that he's talking about right here. Six days of creation and God rested the seventh day. Uh, another passage, uh, Exodus 31, 17. It, talking about the uh, Sabbath, it is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So again, six days creation. Again, that's the obvious meaning there. In the context, we're talking about the Sabbath day. Again, it's not talking about millions of years of time on the Sabbath day. He's talking about one 24-hour period of time. And in that same context, talk about creation being in six days. Now, Bill's going to get us here in just a minute. I hope I can, I'm going to try to get through this. I found this online. I thought y'all would find this uh, very interesting. I'm not a Hebrew scholar by any stretch of imagination, but I can read what people have said about the Hebrew language here. So again, this is not my words. I, I copied these. I stole these. The key to understanding what the days of Genesis 1 really mean is to look at the use of the Hebrew word for day. Right, what, did, what did it mean in the original language? The Hebrew word is yom and is used throughout the Old Testament having a variety of meanings, including the possibility of referring to an undefined, indeterminate period of time. So people argue, well, they there could mean an extended period of time. And the writer here admits that, yeah, sometimes it, it can mean that. However, the meaning of any word is determined by its context. To avoid bias, we will take Genesis 1 out of the picture, so pretend like that's not even there, and look at Genesis 2 through Malachi 4, the rest of the Old Testament. Let's see how it's used in the original Hebrew and other places. And this was fascinating to me. The Hebrew word yom, translated day here, occurs 2,282 times outside Genesis 1. It occurs 359 times with a number outside of Genesis 1. So what does it mean by that? Some of these occurrences use cardinal numbers like counting numbers. One, two, three. Like one day, two days, three days is what he's talking about. So a number with the word yom. And some use ordinal numbers, discussing degree, like first day, second day, third day. So 359 times appears with a number, yom with a number. In all 359 cases, the context clearly shows that a 24-hour day is being referenced in other passages of the Bible. So if it has a number with it, that defines what is being discussed. Yom occurs 19 times outside of Genesis 1, together with either the word morning or evening. In all 19 cases, a 24-hour day is clearly intended. The words morning and evening occur together without day 38 times outside of Genesis 1. So 19 plus 38, 57 times uh, the, either day or morning, evening. Each of these occurrences refers to a literal 24-hour period of time. Finally, the Hebrew yom occurs with the word night 53 times outside Genesis 1. It says, guess what? Each of these occurrences refers to a 24-hour period of time. Given this immense contextual evidence, one is tempted to ask somewhat flippantly, what could God have done to emphasize that the days of Genesis 1 are literal 24-hour days? Might suggest, the writer says, that he could have used the Hebrew yom together with numbers morning, evening, or night. And that's exactly what he did. Matter of fact, there is another word in the Hebrew that I've run across uh, called olam that can, is more definite for an extended period of time. That's not the word here. It's the word yom. Dallas. Hey, Coach, one thing on that day, day age theory is, one, if God rested for the whole seventh day, that means man and woman were in darkness or, or complete sunlight forever, which you can look at today in Alaska and the southern hemisphere, all Alaska in the far north and anything in the far southern hemisphere. Man doesn't do well in night for, for long periods of time. And two, if the earth isn't spinning at the rate it's spinning to make a 24-hour day, people start floating. And animals 
animals start floating, and, and gravity doesn't work the way gravity works. So all the living beasts and everything wouldn't function the way they were supposed to. That's a great point. Great point. Thank you, Brother Dallas. Appreciate y'all's good attention and good comments today.